Sue, when do you guys leave? Um, the day after Christmas. Oh, okay. Eight o'clock in the morning. Where are you headed? Wyoming. Oh, okay. You're going out to see the kids. Yeah. And then are you going to stay for New Year's? Yeah, we'll be back, I think, the 5th of January. My birthday. The 4th. The 4th. We have, you know, Ethan is guiding snowmobiles, so we'll take a trip with him and let him guide us, so. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. Yeah. Come on in, Josh. You're fine. Yeah, there's... Josh is a Have a seat. We're okay. Josh is here. Richard's uh, finishing some shoveling, and then uh, Kathy and Janet may or may not show up at some point. So, go ahead and get started whenever. Okay. Yeah, let's. I've got uh, you've got a lot of material to cover this morning. We pick up. Oops. Somebody wants in. Hang on a second. Folks. Better view might be up there, but okay, wherever you must. Be. We pick up somebody else. We're going to begin with the fourth strobe <coughs> with. <coughs> Brown is really verses 14 and 16. It's very apparent that 15, the commentary on John the Baptist, John testified to him by proclaiming, this is he of whom I said, the one who comes after ranks ahead, uh, is a, a textual addition. Not only doesn't it scan as poetry, it's really not very good. But just sitting here reading it, it's not very good Greek. But I want to look particularly at 14 and 16. There are those who believe 18 ought to be part of that. And in fact, I count myself as one of those. I'm not so sure about 17. There are some problems involved with what we call the scanning <laughs> of the verse and also uh, the fact that the grammar doesn't quite work. Uh, this is often what happens in edited editions. It is important, and Brown makes a great point of this, to realize that as you get into the fourth stroke of this gospel, of this prologue to the gospel, that you realize that not only is this cumulative, but it also is expansive. It explains, to a certain degree, the rest of the text. Remember last week I said to you, that we start out in the first strobe with time before time, move into creation and the fall, and then in that third strobe, verses 10, 11, the best part of 12, I think Brown's probably correct at the very end of 12, belongs with 13 as commentary on that. But that those, you know, he came to his own and his own didn't receive him, is about the ministry of Jesus. And then in what is probably the clearest and yet starkest of language, <laughs> poetry the prologue says Kai Holobo sucks a geneto and the word became flesh. 
This is the first time since the opening lines of the prologue that Hologos, the word, has been used. It's very apparent in those opening verses. En arche, en Hologos, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Kai Hologos Sarx Egento repeats the opening lines of the prologue. Egento, particularly <coughs> in Old Testament Greek, is often used as a means of expressing is because Hebrew has no present tense for the verb to be. So the word became flesh. It is the best, most complete understanding of the incarnation, at least biblically, that I know of. Simply put, remember that the Logos comes to us first in this poem as time before time, eternity. Eternity is not, remember, endless time, but the end of time. Time is, after all, a human construct. It's a way in which we divide our days and hours and all of those sorts of, of things. You might remember that the Romans, for instance, had 12 hours in the day. This time, they were a lot shorter than in the middle of June. But it was simply their modality for dividing time. Time belongs to our world, which ultimately is always terminal. What the poem, whether Johannine, at least editor, if not writer, sees here is that eternity has entered into time. And in a way in which virtually none of the world that first heard this text would have accepted it. Although the Jews believed flesh was not evil in the sense that the Greeks thought of the flesh being less instead of more, the Jews still would have found it difficult to believe that God took <coughs> on in form. And that's exactly what these lines mean in Greek. The word became flesh. God took human form. Much like the passage that we looked at in Philippians when we were doing the creed. <coughs> so that it is the reality, it's a, it's a striking sense. None of the Greeks, you know, the Greeks believed in Logos. There was really a lot of Greek philosophy that looked at Logos as the kind of reason and the order and the all that was good. But the whole idea that that would be enfleshed was just anathema to their understanding. It's a whole platonic understanding of the soul as opposed to matter, where the idea was to be released from the mortal into the immortal. 
And this is, in some ways, just the converse of that. Also note that the Kai theme picks up, that's part of the poetry of this, and we'll talk a little bit as we get to 16 uh, about that. Kai hologo sarks e geneto, kai eskenosin en hemen, kai, and I apologize in your handouts, there is a an H there, I thought, when I must have read it quickly and thought it was rough. It is simply E, T H E. Ethe asametha, ten doxen autem, ten doxen host, monogenes par patros, pleris peritos kai alifesis. Literally. and tabernacled among us and we beheld the glory of him the glory and we'll come to this i have it transliterated for you as only begotten but that's really not what the word means from the father full of grace and truth now the very next phrase here okay, is going to in Haman and tabernacled among us. The verb literally means to tent, to pitch one's tent. But it has a much stronger theme than that. I remember one of our my colleagues saying, oh, this means attempting with us. This isn't about Jesus camping out with us. It has a much more profound background. You might remember in the Exodus story that God commands the Jews to build a tabernacle so that he may dwell with his people. It is about the presence of God with his people. It is also about the presence of God among men. Ron points out, and I think rightly, that Haman, which is us, is a general term. <coughs> The we in the next clause, and we beheld the glory, is about the community. It's about the apostolic witness. That is, one is the object of a preposition, ain Haman, among us, in us, quite literally, in us. And the other is the we is in the verb itself. It is the second person, or excuse me, the first person plural uh, of that verb in the uh, aortus. It is in the aortus tense. So, but tabernacle is not only about God's dwelling with his people or about a theme that will be part of John's gospel. Remember the cleansing of the temple in a Canaan account comes at the very beginnings of John's gospel. It comes in chapter 2. And there we learn Jesus is a replacement for the temple. And the temple, after all, was a replacement for the tabernacle. There is also, in Hebrew, the radical, S-K-N, 
is literally means he tends it's radicals are always the third person singular of a verb but radicals are also root letters that create a whole series of words and the most customary one best known certainly was known by the Johannine community is Shekinah. The Shekinah <coughs> is the heart of God and the Shekinah <coughs> was uh, the sense of God's presence. Ezekiel said that when the temple was destroyed, when the, the first temple, Solomon's temple, learning captivity, that before that happened, the Shekinah of God departed from the temple. Whereas when it was rebuilt, it would come back. I remember Ezekiel didn't live to see the rebuilt the temple. But that was always the question, even right prior to the birth of our Lord. Herod the Great had a great program to kind of rebuild and refurbish the Sunken Temple. Because there had always been this question about whether God was really present, was a Shekinah in the Temple. And for the early Christians, Jesus replaced the Shekinah. And in fact, that's exactly what this line of poetry goes on to say. And we beheld the glory of him. Doxa and Shekinah are changeable words. One is Hebrew, the other is Greek. We beheld his glory, the glory of now, in your transliteration, I put down what everybody puts down, the only begotten. The problem is, monogenesis doesn't mean that. In like, fact, there's no warrant in Greek for that translation. It's just that if you look at almost any transliteration, you'll find it written that way. And I'm about to explain to you why, because it's not unimportant. Monogenesis literally means one of a kind, one of a kind, as in only or precious. It's the word in the Septuagint used to translate the Hebrew word Yahid. Yahid is the word used, the easiest example I can give you is the 22nd chapter of Genesis, which is the story of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, in which Yahid means his only, his most precious son. And that's the real sense of the word. The early Latin version used the Latin word unicus, which is the right word to use. It means the same thing. I mean, and only a singular. When Jerome did the Latin translation that would hold sway in the West for at least a thousand years, in fact, my contention is it still holds sway. And you'll see why in just a minute. Jerome translated this 
Unigenetus, which in Latin means only begotten. So that when the James translators pick this up, they took Jerome's translation. Jerome did that, by the way, because of the Arian heresy and the late kind of discussions that were still going on. Uh, and so we have always translated in English only begotten. But it means unique. One of the things that the early fathers understood in ways we don't, partly because we're burdened by Trinitarian theology, <coughs> which is really about God, not so much about Jesus. The early church understood Jesus as unique. And even the fathers, and even the Nicene fathers, realized that he was one of a kind, very God and very man. And that's the essence of the incarnation that it is in Jesus and only in Jesus that God becomes <clears throat> so that you and I can become like God or said another way that we can have the divine image. Remember in creation we were made in the image of God that that divine image, marred by the fall, because man has always struggled with what it's like to be like God, to be God-like in character, rather than God-like in power. It's exactly what 13 of this prologue says, he gave them the power, those who were born not of the will of the flesh, of the desire of man, <coughs> but born of God. It is the same theme that will reoccur in, Nicodemus, in the Nicodemus story. Remember there, there's an interplay between <clears throat> born again and born from on high. That phraseology in Greek can mean either. And what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is exactly what's in the prologue. You must be born from God so that your life can be restored into his life. So that's the uniqueness of the church sees in Jesus. One of a kind, it's not so much about the virgin birth or the sense in which the fathers, when they were going through all the credo arguments, discussed the begottenness of God. This is about the uniqueness of the event. Christmas, in that sense, is part of that unique event. Otherwise, we wouldn't celebrate it in the way we do. All of you are familiar with the whole kind of movement that's been around most of my adult life. <coughs> Putting Christ back in Christmas, I used to say, yeah, well, we're the people who kept the Mass in Christmas. Because essential about the Christ Mass, which is really what Christmas means, <coughs> is not just celebrating Jesus' birthday, 
remembering his presence then and now. And in the Mass, Christ is truly present. <coughs> is with us. So that's uh, it's kind of now. From the Father, his only. Let me read uh, Brown's translation. And we have seen his glory, the glory of an only Son coming from the Father. Brown is, I think, correct in saying that that coming, which was added, uh, is necessary. An understanding. It's also necessary for a thing to sound more poetic in English. Uh, there is a, a sense in which we, because we read monogenos as only begotten, <coughs> we read it then only begotten from the Father, and that's that has to do with what's called the Trinitarian procession, which is just not possible in the Johanna <coughs> Gospel. Or as I used to like to say to students, the Trinity is implied in the scriptures. It is not, while it is scriptural, that is, it's based upon a solid understanding of scripture. There's no place you can go and point except for gloss in the very end of Matthew's gospel. And it is, I assure you, a gloss. <coughs> you know what I'm talking about. We will baptize baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. It had about as much chance of being on the originals of Matthew's gospel as I have a turning 40 in January. So, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not much likelihood of that, I'll say. And it, it goes on to say, and Pleres Keritos Kai Altheos, the exact translation, the transliteration is Pleres, full of grace and truth. But you will notice that Brown in his translation says, coming from the Father filled with enduring love. Now, we're going to get into something that is difficult at best, and I promised myself when I looked at this I would try to stay out of weeds, but I'm not sure I can. There is a great number of scholars, and Brown is certainly among them, who believe that these two words, as we have in Caritos and Altheos, Altheos, excuse me, and my glasses are really are used for he the Hebrew it has said and I met now has said is a covenant word in the 79 prayer book in the Psalter, which is a translation of Psalter, I really don't care for it, but it's ready to hand as an example. Said often gets translated in, the, in that particular translation of Psalms as loving kindness. Certainly has that sense about it. It is about the covenant love of God for Israel. Uh, more often than not, certainly in the Septuagint, 
the word gets translated with the Greek pietos, which is mercy. And essentially, we get our word piety from it. But pietos, strictly in Greek, is, is mercy. However, there is plenty of witness to the fact that charis, grace, was used as a translation, particularly in the late Tangrams, which are uh, kind of popular translations of the scripture done in um, Aramaic and some of the other Semitic dialects, which really weren't totally Semitic. They were kind of a mixture of, of the Semitic and the Greek. And John, whoever wrote John and or whoever edited it, <coughs> is known to often quote the scripture from those kinds of sources. When I say scripture, I mean the Old Testament, as we're writing the New Testament, rather than to use a Septuagint. Um, and that's, if you think about it, not so unusual. Um, it's kind of like using the King James Bible. As the old lady said, it was good enough for Christ and the flow of apostles, good enough for her. So you have this sense that the set and the meth. The meth means the fidelity of God to his promise, to his covenant. I think that's the best way to explain it. At the very least, when I look at this, you have what's called a henditas, which you have two nouns, and they're clearly nouns, but the second one modifies the first. So that even if you read it quite literally, you would get true grace and grace and truth. Um, so either way, I think Brown is onto something when he translates this phraseology, enduring love. Through grace. <coughs> or has said in their mouth, God's mercy and steadfastness. I did a monologue some years ago. I suck <laughs> about 45, I think, uh, on the, uh, one of my favorite passages, like a Six eight. God has showed the young man what he requires to do justice, to love mercy, to walk wisely. And I did it to show that Micah was a great summary of the eighth century. The sense of God's glory of his people is found in the scripture. So uh, we want to continue with that. And then, as I said, 15 is a gloss. And that's, uh, we know that 16, he pulls up 
Now, if you look at the group that I gave you, you'll find that it says Hote Nek Tong, where Romanos, where Romanos, because of the fullness of him. Brown chooses to translate this and of his fullness. The best attempt, a test of Greek text. Oops, I'm not going to make the thing on The best attested Greek text has Hote in it. But as I told you when we began to talk about this, the kind of Greek that most of us work from is the BDF. It's, it's a composite text where scholars have taken the best attested text and put together a Greek reading. <coughs> there is, certainly in the fathers, uh, the decent attestation for Kai here instead of Hoti. Brown takes it as that, partly because it makes better scamming. It fits the poetry meter better to read as Kai. And there certainly is justification for it. In some ways, it doesn't change the meaning all that much. So, uh, Kai is probably just as well as, as <clears throat> and of his fullness, we have all had a share of love in place of love. Now, the actual test says Kai Kari's ante. Aritos, uh, which is you know just a different form of Aris. Grace against race. Because of his fullness, in his fullness, of his fullness, it's the equation the act of God. It is who Jesus is and what Jesus does that gives us the share. Love in place of love. Now, 17 is an explanation of that statement of exactly what the poem means by saying that. For while the law was a gift through Moses, this enduring love came through Jesus Christ. In other words, <clears throat> Jesus is the new revelation of God back when we were talking about God dwelling in the tabernacle, it is almost impossible, I think, for us to realize we're so kind of soaked in the idea that's part of the Reformation, but that doesn't make it right, uh, that there was this argument between law and gospel. That's a very Lutheran <coughs> thing. <coughs> when Paul talks about the law and Christ, Paul is talking about the old revelation and the new revelation. He's talking about the fact that when you say Torah, we're talking about the revelation of God on Sinai. The Jews didn't keep the law to go to heaven. It's 
a nice idea, it's just not true. They kept the law because they were God's people and that obligated them to act in the way in which God's people ought to live and act. Right, that's what Paul means when he talks about the law of Christ. There's a sense in which, and it's very apparent in John's gospel, Jesus is the new, complete revelation of who God is. Because God is revealed in the text. So there can be no mistake what God's like, because we'll see it on Good Friday and Easter morning. Both the enduring gift of love and the outcome of it, which is, for John, eternal life. Or as my friend Tom Wright is fond of saying, it's not about life after death, it's about life after life after death. <laughs> That's it. Think about that. It's about life after life after death. It's not to say that nothing happens to us when we die. But whatever it is, it's not final because the finality is the resurrection. And you and I, if we share in his life, must be assured of the resurrection. So that this is a sense in which the first revelation which was indeed a gift, was given through Moses. <clears throat> but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In other words, the same enduring love true grace. And here I'm almost inclined to think that my own understanding of this as a Hemvetus may even be the better translation. True grace came through Jesus Christ. The ultimate revelation of God. And then in 18, now there are several, and I'm not sure I'm not one of them, who thinks 18 really belongs as part of the poem. It certainly can be read that way. No one has, seen, has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, ever at the Father's side who has revealed him. There again, if nothing else, it is a further explanation of what the poem itself says. That the reality of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. It is a sense in which the incarnation can only be understood in terms of a revelation. And that revelation can only be for those who are willing to be born again of the Spirit of God. There is, in many ways, this is a very concise recap of the Christian message. So, I think we're about I remember. I'm so used to this. Yep. Well, that works.
times up our time together, <coughs> you can see why John's gospel, even in its very beginnings, is just full of diamonds and pearls. It's all kinds of great stuff in the gospel of John. But you can see more importantly why this was for a thousand years the church's gospel for the Christmas Mass. It was good then. It's probably good now. You take this chance because I know people will tune in during the week as well. We wish you all a blessed and joyous Christmas. And may the living Christ be born again in you. Okay. Thank you. The same to you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Oh, I'll get it, Richard. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you're still you're not that you couldn't do it, but mm -hmm. I no. need.